Hi, my name is Christine and I'm a survivor of both breast cancer and lung cancer in the primary stage. While I was going through my breast cancer staging and getting everything done, we were doing secondary testing in um, CT form. And during that time, we noticed there was a nodule on my lung. And so I really had to advocate for myself as we went through the process to find out what this nodule really was. So it was about two months into my breast cancer journey that we did the CT scan. And the reason we did it was because I was so far along in my breast cancer journey that they wanted to test other areas of my body to see if it had migrated. So we tested the liver, we tested the brain, and we tested the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as well as uh, my reproductive organs. And so in all of those tests, everything came back negative, except for this lung nodule that um, had popped up. And at first the doctors said it could be a fatty tissue deposit, it could be an air tissue deposit, it could be all kinds of things that are really standard and normal and it's not to worry. However, I was not at all comfortable with it because my breast cancer was on my left side and it was in the lower lobe of my lung on the left side, which was directly behind the breast. So for me, I spent a good five months really thinking that I have stage four breast cancer and I don't know what this is going to be like. And so I had to push a bit to get the testing on the biopsy, to get it biopsy, because they really said, we're just gonna watch it, it's nothing. And they redid a CT scan um, in preparation for my surgery. And we realized that it got smaller during my chemotherapy. So that was a clear indicator that this, it's changing. So it's not just a fat deposit or an air deposit. So what was crazy about all of this is that in, in the process of trying to deal with breast cancer, they forgot that they gave me a CT scan. And so they didn't check it. I was all prepared for my surgery and no one knew except me who checked my own health, health records that this was changing. So the original scan done two months into my breast cancer journey showed, I believe it was 1.4 centimeters in size. And then um, when we did the, um, when we went in for the five, for the surgery, we realized that it had changed to, I believe, 1.1. So it got smaller in that five months of chemotherapy. And so I literally called my oncologist on the cell phone and was like, have you seen the CT scan? And he was like, the what? I'm like, the CT scan that I made you give me? And so then he went in and read it and was like, oh, I got to make some phone calls. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> It was wild. I like, I started falling through the cracks. They forgot because they were so busy with the process of my breast cancer that they just didn't think to check it. And they had forgotten that they gave it to me. And, and I was just frustrated one night and I checked it and I realized it changed. And so then that's when I started making phone calls and uh, setting off alarms. In my past life, I was a very strong people pleaser. And so if, if the guy in the white coat told me it's not to worry about, I would just listen. And when this all happened and I started checking my own scans, I really pulled out a version of me that had lied dormant for a long time. And I got really, really unapologetic about who I was and what I wanted. And so I was able to make phone calls. I called my oncologist on his cell phone, uh, you know, and I just said, hey, like, I don't know how I got your phone number, but I need to talk to you. <laughs> and so, you know, I really, I really found it quite empowering 
at that time to say, I want a P I want a PET scan. I want that done. I want a biopsy. We're doing this. And, you know, and, and that was really, it really brought up a, a version of me that I didn't know prior to this. Well, in a very short period of time, I got a call from a lung oncologist saying, Hey, we want to get, we want to give you a biopsy and we want to get that PET scan that you asked for. And we want to do all of these things. And so it really, it really kicked into high gear because we were really, truly running out of time in a lot of ways. We had my breast surgery scan or breast surgery scheduled. And so we needed to really hit this hard. So I did a bunch of testing in a short period of time. The lung biopsy, which was very uncomfortable, um, came back inconclusive. So they weren't able to get it because of where it was and what it was attached to, they weren't able to get around the rib in order to test it. So I was referred to a, well, at first they said, so it's probably still nothing. And I was like, nope, like, well, who am I talking to next? Like, who else do you have in your arsenal? Because that I'm not accepting that. And so they said, who else do you need to speak to? a surgeon would be the next natural step. So I got in contact with the surgeon and his bedside manner wasn't the best. And he was like, people in your age, like it's probably a fat deposit nor an air pocket. You know, it could have changed in size because of the, the, the scan itself. I don't feel that it's really anything, but if you want for your peace of mind to remove it, I'll do that for you. So he decided that he was going to, going to remove it. And we decided together that we were going to remove it for peace of mind, as he said. And I um, also, because of its proximity to the breast was still in this place where it could very well be stage four breast cancer. And I just was not comfortable with that because my PET also came back inconclusive. So there was really no reason at all to take this nodule out other than an intuitive inclination that I'm not okay with leaving it there. Yeah. So within two weeks time, two or three weeks time, I was scheduled for a lung resection, a lower lung resection. So it was about a month's time from when I had my breast surgery to when I had my lung surgery. So it was a very quick turnaround and they did a laparoscopic surgery in my lung to remove this nodule. Everything that I went through, it was so difficult, but the trauma that I don't know that I really dealt with was this surgery. And, you know, I feel it, I feel it deeply when I speak about it. The, when I woke up from that surgery, which was supposed to be quite smooth, I had a reaction of some kind. There is a word for it. I don't recall what the medical term is, but it's a spasming of the lung. And so what it does for the patient is it makes it so they can't breathe in deep. And you wake up drugged and confused and you can't breathe. And The most natural thing to do as a human is to breathe. And I think the scariest thing to lose is breath. And it was a very scary time. And my husband wasn't allowed in the hospital because I was still in the surgery part because of of COVID, (laughs) you know, and he didn't know what was wrong with me. And he didn't know if I was okay. No one would give anyone any answers. It was awful. So once I started to heal, which took some time, um, especially because of that, that spasming, I did a lot of inflammatory damage to myself um, just from that tensing. So once, once I started to heal from the resection, which I stayed an extra night in the hospital than they had expected me to based on that reaction, um, I was able to go home and start working on my lung capacity as well as trying to get um, my arms and and, uh, strength in my upper chest capacity up. So I was doing all kinds of physio all at the same time. And after a period of about two to three weeks, 
I got a call from the lung oncologist or rather from the surgeon. And he said, have you ever smoked? And I said, no, I haven't. Why? He goes, well, it was cancer. You were right. It was cancer. And I was like, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) and uh, he said, I just, I'm shocked. I didn't expect it to be. And I said, well, so what does this mean? Do I have stage four breast cancer? He said, no, it's wild because it's actually a second cancer that you had at the same time as your breast cancer in its own primary way. The surgeon also asked me, after asking if I had smoked, he asked me if I've ever heard of radon gas. And I had never heard of it. And he said that there's they've tested it for genetic markers and there is none. So they said, as far as we know, this has got to be environmental. So they asked if, if I have any way of testing my childhood home for radon gas. And so that's what I did is I got connected with the lung association in my province. We tested my childhood home and it came back high. So we believe that the reason that this cancer expressed is because I was already in a breast cancer state. And so it allowed another cancer to come through that was lying dormant that we believe is is caused by radon gas. So for me, I was very fortunate to catch it very early. So they've never given me an official staging, but from what I understand um, from my oncologist, he believes it was a 2A. So like just barely a stage two, which tends to be completely asymptomatic for anybody in, in that stage. So I was really fortunate to be able to have it removed with clear borders right away. And so there was no no treatment plan because we were already radiating. We were already following with a left side radiation for my breast and the, the, the lung tumor was directly behind my breast on the left side. So the radiation took care of what they would have done anyway. It's so important to listen to your intuition, to whatever version of, of speaking that's coming through to you that says, hey, this, there's something wrong here. Because we as women, we get ourselves into so much trouble pushing that down because we want to be the good girl. And it's just not, it's not serving you. It's not serving anyone around you. Speak your mind, speak your truth. If something says this isn't right, in whatever capacity that is, especially in cancer, stand up and say no. Learn to to be the powerful person that you are. I think that we all have an ability to be intuitive about our own bodies. And I mean, I, I, I can't speak for men, but I know that women, we truly know what we what's going on. You know, we know what's going on in our relationships. We know what's going on in our friendships. We know what's going on in our bodies. And there's a part of us that that from young age was told, don't make a scene and, you know, be the good girl that everyone wants you to be and don't speak up. So we don't and we push it down. And really what cancer gave me was the ability to hear those voices, those that small little voice that says, hey, there's something wrong here and communicate it. In life, in my life, there is, I've always wanted to do some things that I thought someday I'll do them. And one of them is, is coaching. I always wanted to be a mentorship. I wanted to be in psychology. I wanted to help people, but I felt too small. I felt like I was, who am I to be this? And so when I had my breast cancer save me from lung cancer, I just said, there is a reason I'm here. There is a reason that I am put on this earth. I am one of the lucky ones. I got to keep my life. And so for that reason, I just live every part of life in its absolute fullest. I launched into my career. I now help women going through cancer and I don't apologize for any of it. I travel the world. I I, if, if someone said, Hey, let's skydive, I'd say, yes, 
like at this point, there's nothing in this life that I'm willing to wait for because whatever this was that allowed my breast cancer to catch my lung cancer, it was heaven sent. The biggest thing that I would add is that that bad things happen to everyone. And sometimes it's cancer and sometimes it's a divorce and sometimes it's a loss of somebody you love. And there's all, there's so many things that it could be. Oh, every single time there is a way to take that pain and alchemize it. There is a way to turn that pain into power. And I invite you, the listener, to do that. To not be not fall victim to the situation that happened to you, but instead to transmute what you went through into the version of you that you've always wanted to be.